In our ongoing studies of enzyme kinetics and inhibition, in this lesson we want to look at competitive inhibition. This is the first of our models for reversible enzyme inhibition. In each case of reversible inhibition, the inhibitor will bind the enzyme and that will change one of our kinetic constants, either Kcat, remember that's directly related to Vmax, or it will change Km, remember that's a measure of substrate affinity, or it might change both. Let's look at competitive inhibition. In the simplest case, the inhibitor resembles the substrate. Here we have the example of succinate dehydrogenase. It catalyzes the conversion of succinate to fumarate. So notice we've oxidized the carbon-carbon bond here between the two methylene groups to form a double bond. Malinate is a competitive inhibitor of this reaction. Notice it resembles very closely succinate. We're simply missing one of those methylene groups. And so malinate can bind in the active site in place of succinate. But notice in this case no chemistry can occur because we're missing one of the methylene groups. I would point out here the distinction between a reversible competitive inhibitor and a suicide substrate that we saw in our previous lesson. Remember, for the suicide substrate, it does resemble the native substrate, and yet we start catalysis, but we can't finish. It gets stuck irreversibly in the active site. In the case of a reversible inhibitor, however, it does resemble the natural substrate, but no chemistry occurs, and so binding is reversible. In other words, the inhibitor may bind, and then it might release. That's what makes it reversible. Let's see how that model works, and that's illustrated on the lower right of your screen here. Here we have the free enzyme. It combined substrate. In that case, we form enzyme substrate complex, and we can therefore form product. So in other words, as soon as the substrate binds, we can form product. If substrate binds, we get product. There's nothing to prevent that step. If, however, the free enzyme binds the inhibitor, now we form the unproductive enzyme inhibitor complex in which the substrate cannot bind, and therefore we don't get the product. Notice this is reversible inhibition, so even though the enzyme uh, inhibitor complex is unproductive, that enzyme might release the inhibitor and will over time, and therefore now we have the free form of the enzyme in which it can bind substrate and make product. So that's our reversible competitive inhibition model. The substrate and inhibitor binding are mutually exclusive. In other words, they're binding at the same location, and so they can't both bind at the same time. The question is, can you overcome this type of inhibition? And yes, you can. Since it's a simple competition for the same site between substrate and inhibitor, if we add more substrate, we make it more likely that the enzyme will bind substrate than it will bind inhibitor. So the question is, what's going to change in this case? Will we change the Kcat, the Vmax, or will we change Km, or will we change both? The key here is to recognize that if substrate binds, we still get product at the same rate. So there's no change in catalysis. This means there's no change in Vmax. But we did change the step where enzyme binds substrate. In other words, we reduced the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. And that means we increase the Km. Remember, the Km is a measure of the substrate affinity. And so as Km decreases, affinity increases. And so if the inhibitor reduces affinity, we're going to increase Km. Let's see how that looks in our hyperbolic plot. Here's a figure from your book, and your book will con consistently use the traffic signal colors. That is to say, green indicates go, the reaction in the absence of the inhibitor, whereas red indicates stop, the presence of the inhibitor. So here's our green curve here in the absence of the inhibitor. We're increasing velocity as we increase substrate concentration until we reach some saturating point where all of our enzyme molecules are saturated with substrate and that's our Vmax. So remember, we estimate Km, we find our Vmax, we find our 1 half Vmax, and then we go over to our green curve. We follow that down on the x-axis and that substrate concentration represents our Km. We call this the true Km. 
that is it's the inherent affinity of the enzyme for the substrate in the absence of any other factor let's see how that changes as we add inhibitor that's our red curve here we find that we reach that same Vmax that has not changed and so to find our KM we we find the same halfway point one half Vmax we follow that over to our red curve and that substrate concentration is our new KM notice it's increased so we've reduced affinity for that substrate our curve has shifted right so we call the KM in the presence of the inhibitor the apparent KM. It's not the true KM. It's been perturbed by the presence of the inhibitor and it's increased by a factor alpha. We're going to look at alpha in just a minute. So in the presence of the inhibitor we've increased KM by this factor alpha but we have not changed Vmax. So the question is how will this look on those line weaver Burke plots? Remember, we're going to plot 1 over V0 on the y-axis versus 1 over substrate concentration on the x-axis. Again, the green line represents the absence of the inhibitor. Our y-intercept is 1 over Vmax, and our x-intercept is negative 1 over Km. So if we take our y-intercept, we can find the true Vmax. If we take our x-intercept, we can find the true Km, and of course that's in the absence of the inhibitor. Once we add the inhibitor, that's our red line, then we find we have the same Vmax, so we're going to have the same y-intercept. That won't change, so the lines will intersect on the y-axis. But since we've increased Km, and our x-intercept is the negative inverse of Km, then that means our x-intercept has decreased. In other words, it's closer to our zero point here on the y uh, or x-axis. Now since the slope of this curve is Km over Vmax, if we've increased Km by that factor alpha, then we've increased our slope. So again, let's compare those two. In the presence of the inhibitor, our y-intercept, that is our Vmax, is the same. The x-intercept is closer to zero and our slope has increased by this factor alpha. Well, let's, let's look at that factor alpha. Alpha is always equal to 1 plus the concentration of inhibitor over Ki. Now we didn't derive this expression but let's see the logic of this relationship. So remember, alpha, as alpha increases that's going to increase Km and that's going to inhibit more strongly. Now you'll notice that alpha is directly related to inhibitor concentration. In other words, as we add more inhibitor, alpha increases and Km increases, and we've inhibited more and more. And this is just what we might logically expect. If the inhibitor increases Km, the more inhibitor we add, the more it's going to increase that value, the more it will inhibit the reaction. Notice alpha is inversely related to Ki so that as Ki decreases, alpha increases. So as Ki gets smaller, it inhibits more and more. Ki, notice this is an equilibrium constant, is a measure of the enzyme's affinity for the inhibitor. So as Ki gets smaller, it, the enzyme has more and more of an affinity for the inhibitor and therefore it will inhibit more. Again, this makes sense in our expression for alpha. So Ki is analogous to Km in the sense that as Km is a measure of the enzyme's affinity for substrate, so Ki is a measure of the enzyme's affinity for inhibitor. So if we were a drug company and we wanted to design a drug that would inhibit a particular enzymatic reaction and we were looking at a, a panel of potential inhibitors, we'd want to find the one with the lowest Ki because that would inhibit the most strongly. That would be the more potent inhibitor. In the simplest case, we saw that competitive inhibitors often resemble the substrate. But remember, enzymes work by binding tightly to that transition state. In other words, sometimes they bind more tightly to the transition state molecule than the substrate. And so we often find that the more potent competitive inhibitor is one that resembles that transition state. It binds more tightly 
Here's the example of the reaction catalyzed by triose phosphate isomerase. It catalyzes the isomerization of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate to form dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and the intermediate in brackets here is ene diolate. So an effective competitive inhibitor is phosphoglycohydroxinate. As you can see, it looks very much like ene diolate, except instead of having a carbon-carbon double bond, we have a carbon-nitrogen double bond. So again, it's close enough to that transition state, and it's called a transition state analog, that it will bind very tightly to the enzyme and be a very effective inhibitor. In our next lesson, we want to look at some other types of reversible inhibitors, see how they exert their effects, and how do they change those kinetic constants.